welcome um, welcome to everyone from i2 um welcome to our webinar on class actions we have a number of people from norton rose from our insurance litigation team uh, who will be doing presentations or giving presentations on various aspects of class actions um, we're going to start with natasha naidu who's a director in our Johannesburg office, who's going to give um, a talk on the history of class actions and various other aspects. I will talk about Lita's contest start here and the transmissibility of general damages, and so it will go on. So um, can I suggest that if anyone has any questions, you put your hand up. Um, someone will need to monitor the chats and just to see if there are questions being asked. Um, but thank you very much. Can we start with Natasha? And Manu will run the slides. Sure. Thanks very much, Dev, for the introduction. Good morning, everyone, and welcome once again. I will give you a brief rundown of the history of class actions in South Africa. So class actions were not recognized prior to 1994, and it came about as a result of the 1993 Constitution. Since then, new laws were enacted aimed at promoting and protecting the fundamental rights of human beings from grave injustice. Following the introduction of the Bill of Rights, people were able to enforce their rights as contained in the Bill. And as such, the interim constitution and the final constitution made provision for class actions to be founded based on constitutional principles. But while provision had been made, for class actions, the procedure in terms of which class actions should actually be instituted and how they should proceed to finality was not provided for and has never been set out in any legislation. The South African Law Commission in 2008 published a report in terms of which it set out the class actions procedure as it basically applies today. Various recommendations were made with regards to how class actions should be instituted and how the litigation should proceed until the class action is finalized. A draft bill was also then issued, which dealt with the manner in which class actions should proceed. But while both the interim constitution and the final constitution make provision for class actions, there is still no specific legislation in South Africa that deals with class actions and it is therefore not regulated by statute or in terms of any rules. The law on class actions is slowly developing and evolving in terms of the common law and case law or precedence. But that is not to say that a class action cannot be founded, for example, in terms of Section 61 of the Consumer Prote Protection Act of 2008, which provides for strict liability, as you know. And this would be in terms of which a producer or importer, distributor or retailer of any goods is liable for any harm caused wholly or partly as a consequence of supplying any unsafe goods, product failure, defect or hazard in any goods, or inadequate instructions or warnings provided to the consumer regarding any hazard that can arise with the use of the goods. And irrespective of whether the harm resulted from negligence, on the part of the producer, importer, as the case may be. So the CPA will be applicable should a class action be brought against a manufacturer, for example, for damages caused as a result of defective products. So the product liability issues pose a major threat, both in terms of monetary damages and reputational damages to be suffered by manufacturers. So manufacturers, for example, need to be alert to the CPA, which is aimed at protecting the rights of consumers. What is perhaps of great significance is that there have been developments over the years in formulating a framework based on case law and the uniform rules of court. And this framework is aimed at developing a structure for the manner in which class actions must be dealt with. Currently, class actions are dealt with in terms of the uniform rules of court and the constitution, as I said earlier, which provides the basis for a class action to be brought in respect of an infringement or a threat to a right as contained in the Bill of Rights. 
Be that as it may, most recent statistics on the number of class actions in South Africa show that South Africa has seen a 300% increase in the number of class action certification judgments delivered over the past decade. And the country seems to be following the trends in Western countries where class actions have been instituted. One can attribute the slow development of class actions here in South Africa to the fact that only few cases have been adjudicated upon by the courts because most of them never pass the certification stage. Further, a number of class actions end up with the parties deciding to settle shortly after certification. But what is clear from a recent judgment delivered by the SCA is that South African courts are largely in favor of granting indigent lit litigants with access to justice and place a great deal of emphasis on businesses assuming responsibility to remedy the impact of their activities. Thank you. Hi everyone, good morning and thanks very much again to the team at i2 for inviting us to speak with you all. My name is Lisa Krichler and I'm an associate in Norton Rose Fulbright's insurance team in Johannesburg. So as Natasha had said, at no stage in this relatively brief history of class actions in South Africa was there ever, you know, a class action act that was brought into law by parliament. And class action procedure has therefore largely been developed by our courts when they've been called upon to adjudicate on class action disputes. So how does it actually work? Very, very simply, all class actions take place in two parts. There is the initial certification stage, which is done by way of application proceedings. And this is usually referred to as the certification application. And then if, and, and only if, that class action is certified, will the actual class action proceed. So what do our courts look at when they consider an application for certification? In this case, up on the screen of the Children's Resource Centre Trust versus Pioneer Foods case, our Supreme Court of Appeal set out various requirements that had to be satisfied before a court would grant certification. So I'm going to go through them, just bear with me for a little bit. We will discuss them in a bit more detail a little bit later on. So firstly, the class should be identifiable with reference to objective criteria. Secondly, the proposed class representative should be suitable to conduct the class action and to represent the class. Thirdly, the relevant cause of action should raise a triable issue. Fourthly, there should exist a right to relief that requires a court to determine issues of fact or of law that are common to all of the members of the class. Fifthly, the relief the class seeks should flow from the cause of action, and this relief should be capable of determination. Sixthly, where damages are claimed, then there should be a procedure or a mechanism by which to allocate those damages to members of the class or to members of the classes. And then finally, the class action should be the most appropriate means by which the claim should be determined, as opposed to some other mechanism provided for in our law, like joinder in terms of the rules of court. So getting this all right at certification stage is quite a tall order, especially when the court said in that Children's Resource Center case that um, the court had to be satisfied that all of these requirements were met before certification would be granted. But having a class action successfully certified now is quite a bit easier following the constitutional court's decision in McAdam versus Pioneer Foods. And this is where the court said that these, you know, what the SEA had called requirements are in fact only factors or elements that a court should take into account when determining whether the interests of justice lean in favor of granting certification. So these factors are just factors and they shouldn't be treated as conditions precedent or things that have to be met before an application for certification can succeed. And now the decision as to whether or not to grant certification is based on, you know, where the interests of justice lie. And so the absence of any one of these factors doesn't necessarily oblige a court to refuse certification where the interests of justice demand otherwise. But that being said, when considering whether an application for certification is likely to be granted, 
it's really worth trying to determine whether these criteria that have been identified by the SCA have actually been met. And it's unwise to try to have a class action certified without demonstrating to the court that these factors have been met. And when they haven't been met, you know, setting out why it would still be in the interest of justice to grant certification. And the opposite is, of course, true for any respondent who wants to oppose an application for certification. You know, if, if a respondent can, at this very early stage, poke enough holes uh, in, the, in the class's certification application and actually prevent the class action from being certified, then that, in the long run, will save all of the parties' time and money. So on to the first factor or element on that list, which is that the class is identifiable. This essentially relates to how the class is defined in the certification application. And in the Steinhoff class action certification, which incidentally failed, Judge Unterhalter noted that the definition of a class provides the foundation for the class action that will follow. So in my view, and you know, despite what the court said in McAdam that you know, these are just elements that have to be considered, I really think that if the class is not properly defined, then certification is going to be very unlikely because the definition is so foundational to the class action that follows. And, you know, how do you get this right? How do you get a definition correct at certification stage? Ultimately, the class must be defined with sufficient precision that any person's membership can be determined objectively by examining their situation in light of the class definition. So, Basically, you need to be able to look at someone and decide whether or not they fall into the class just by applying that definition to their personal circumstances. And it's in fact not necessary to identify all the members of the class by their names, but by description. And actually, if you can identify everybody by name, then it's likely that that definition is under inclusive. And then another mechanism like joinder in terms of the rules of court would be more appropriate than a class action. But if on the other hand, the definition is overextensive, then it can lack coherence and it will be unwieldy and very difficult to apply during the actual class action stage. So for example, there's a great example in an Australian case of Bray versus Hoffman LaRoche Limited, where the class was defined as every man, woman, and child who has been in Australia between 1992 and 1999. So obviously in that case, the litigation would be completely unmanageable and it indicates to the court that is deciding whether or not to grant certification that the class action might not proceed as planned. Um, a class is also very unlikely to satisfy the requirement if the definition makes membership dependent on the outcome of the litigation. So what does that actually mean? If for example, the definition is dependent on members, for example, suffering loss as decided by the court at the class action stage, or on the defendant's ability to raise defenses to some members' claims but not others, then it actually makes it impossible to identify the class and who falls into which class until after certain facts are proven or after certain defenses are rejected. So in other words, the definition is not going to be accepted and it's not gonna work if that definition will only apply at the end of the class action. The definition was actually applied to the class as they stand at certification stage. And it's also very important to remember that class members' rights are affected by certification because they are actually bound by the outcome of the class action if they fall into the class and have not chosen to opt out or they've elected to opt in. So you must remember that, you know, although a class action might proceed, even if you would technically fall into a class, if you don't wish to be part of that class action and you'd rather you know, litigate on your own and brief your own attorneys, you're entitled to do that. But if a person can't actually tell whether they fall into the class based on whether their personal circumstances fit into the definition, then potential class members might be prejudiced by either falling into the class when they don't know it and they don't want to, or they fall outside of the scope of the class when they should, in fact, form part of the class. So these are obviously very, you know, these are very reasonable reasons uh, to require a class to be properly defined before the class action will be certified. And it's also important to remember that it's inevitable that this definition of the class will be relevant to other considerations that the certification court will have to consider. 
So for example, the, the definition of the class will very likely affect which issues are common to that class and also whether the class representative is suitable to represent that class. The broader the class definition is, then it's less likely that members will share the necessary commonality or that the proposed representative will in fact be representative of that class. But I leave this to my team to comment on in more de detail a bit later on. So ultimately on this first element of the class being identifiable, the essential question will always be whether the class is sufficiently precisely identified that, it's, that it is possible to determine at all stages of the proceedings, whether a particular person is a member of the class or not, just by applying that class definition to each person's particular circumstances. And if the applicant at certification stage has failed to formulate the definition coherently, then that's a very strong basis on which to oppose that application for certification, because any class action that follows from a poor definition will likely be very, very difficult and costly to litigate. Thanks very much, everyone. I hand over to Byron, I believe. Thanks, Lisa. Morning, everybody. The next factor which I'll be dealing with in the certification process is that of the presence of a tribal issue. And as uh, Lisa mentioned earlier on, it emanates from the Children's Resources Centre Trust matter where the appellate division set down certain factors to be taken into consideration before certifying a class action. What effectively the court held insofar as this factor is concerned is that prospective applicants to a certification application were henceforth required to attach to their application a draft particulars of claim setting out the in draft format the class action and the issues that they intend to raise on the assumption that the certification application is granted and they were also required to set out the facts which they intended to rely on on affidavit and the reason for that was that the court in determining whether this factor was present was in a position to determine firstly whether there was a legally legally tenable cause of action in other words whether the cause of action in terms of which the class action intended to be instituted was supported in law and secondly whether there was a prima facie case on the evidence or on the facts so in simple terms the court needed to determine in order to establish whether this factor was present whether the applicants are not simply before the court for a I call it a hopeless case. So effectively, the court held that the cause of action must survive a test on exception, and the court must be satisfied that sufficient facts have been pleaded for the for the applicants to be successful eventually. So in rudimentary terms, what it me meant was that to the extent that the class action was intended to be brought based on delict, then the court must be satisfied that the particulars of claim and the facts supporting that draft particulars of claim will ensure that the relevant elements of the, of the delict were present. In other words, that it is something which is accepted in our law as a cause of action um, justifying relief. Sorry, we still have the previous slide, Manu. So what the court, has, as Lisa said, the 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 principle that was adopted was that only if it was clear that the that the case was not legally tenable then the court was to refuse the certification but it was to refuse that as i said only in in circumstances where it was clear but if it wasn't clear then it was to allow the certification to proceed so so the the background of that is that bear in mind that the certification application is a necessary first step so on the assumption that the certification application is granted then the prospective plaintiffs are still entitled or still required to issue the actual action based on which the the, the relief is being sought so conversely prospective defendants still retain the same rights they would have retained in any other matter and to raise for instance, special pleas of prescription or raise uh, issues of exception in the main action. In the Stein of Meta, however, it appears that 
there was room left for certification courts to take a bit more of a proactive approach. The Stein of decision was um, handed down about two years ago. It's Gauteng uh, Division Matter. And in that case, the judge seemed to be aware of the potential cost implications that a class action holds for defendants, as well as the expectations that it creates insofar as plaintiffs are concerned. So the court held that the trial court eventually will be in no better position than the certification court to determine whether a cause of action is tenable in law. In other words, in that matter, there was room left for the certification court to establish at that stage already whether the matter might not be a, a hopeless case, as I, as I indicated earlier on. So if we go to the next slide, Once again, in the sign of decision, reference was also made to the principle that was adopted in other matters where the interest of justice requirement was accepted as a basis for proceeding or certifying certain matters. So the view was held that to the extent that the interest of justice might be served, the courts must not adopt too rigorous approach in determining for instance, whether a tribal issue might be present at that stage. So for instance, the Nkala judgment, uh, the, the court accepted that there was a potential difficulty for the plaintiffs in relation to causality. So one of the classes in that matter uh, were to claim on the basis of contracting tuberculosis. And the court accepted that there might be difficulty, difficulty in showing that by, but for their employment on the mines, they would not have contracted tuberculosis. It nevertheless, in the Nkala judgment, certified the matter because it said that the trial court might be in a better position to determine those type of issues. However, in the Stein of matter, once again, it was, it was held that, as, as set out there, the matter may be framed as one of weight. The absence of a cause of action weighs too heavily to permit a certification. Why would a court trigger the machinery of a class action to determine something that does not exist in law? So the point simply is just that there is scope at the stage of a certification application to argue that even if the certification is granted, then a prospective class might not be successful at the end. Thanks. Over to Mano, who will deal with the issue of commonality. Thank you, Byron. Um, just by way of introduction, every night, everyone, my name is Mano Manabera, and I'm an associate at Norton Rose Fulbright in the Johannesburg office. So I will be discussing the issue of commonality. As you can imagine, there are a number of people that will be involved in this application and in the certification process. So commonality is one of the issues that the court will have to look at. And it's not a requirement, as Lisa has said, but it's one of the factors that are considered when you look at the certification application. Now, a court will seek to determine whether there's sufficient points of commonality in relation to the question of law and fact applicable to each member of class. So it's not only an issue of looking at the law or looking at the facts alone, but it's, it's an issue that considers the law and the facts of each member of the class in order for the court to determine and certify the application. Now, also, I refer to the case of the Children Resource um. Center Trust, which uh, Lisa referred to earlier, which also discusses commonality. And it goes on to proceed that commonality does not require every claim in a class action to be identical, which means not everyone must have suffered this exact same type of symptoms or exact uh, same time of loss. It, it, it must not be identical. That's one of the key factors that the court alluded to in this case. It proceeded to say, to say the following, that the issue of fact, law, or both, that are common to all members of a class can appropriately be determined in one action. So it goes on to say that it must either be fact, it must either be law, or it can be both. I've just also illustrated an example. The issue of negligence involving a derailment of a train could give rise to different claims. For an example, it could give rise to damages for personal injuries, or it could give rise to um, claims for loss of support by the, uh, by the dependents. 
but there will be a sufficient commonality on the issue of negligence. As you can imagine, they will each need to determine that there was negligence should they proceed in delict. So that could be enough to sustain a, a class action and make sure that the issue of commonality and the factor is adequately dealt with. And this would, might result in two different classes being formed in any certification process. The, the first class usually raises issues of fact common to all members and class two issues no um raises issues of no common issues of law or fact shared by the members of the proposed class. Now, in dealing further with commonality, I refer to the to the judgment of Nkala and others versus Harmony Gold, where a number of applicants were suing that the mines did not take appropriate measures to prevent them from um, um consequentially having tuberculosis and, and other diseases. And then the, the respondents, these are the mines, argued that a class action would only be appropriate when the factual and the legal issues common to all class members had weighed the non-common issues. The court disagreed. The court held that the requirements in Child Resource Center are merely factors to be considered when determining the demands of the interest of justice. And just in conclusion of the in the issue of commonality, I refer to the Canadian Supreme Court judgment that held that the common question may require nuanced and varied answers based on the situation of individual members. The commonality requirement does not mean that an identical answer is necessary for all members of the class, or even that the answer must benefit each of them to the same extent. It is enough that the answer to the question does not give rise to conflicting, sorry, to conflicting interest among members. So just in conclusion, the issue of commonality does not mean that everything must be the same. It's either an issue of law, an issue of fact, or an issue of both. So in that regard, I've just run up on commonality. I'll hand over to my colleague, Ritabile, to discuss the representation and legal funding. Thank you. Over to you, Ritabile. Thanks, Manu, and good morning, um, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. I'll just round up on the certification process um, that Lisa had given a breakdown of in the beginning. So the last two remaining are the allocation of damages and the appropriateness of the class actions. And um, these are fairly simple steps that obviously each applicant needs to ensure that is they comply with and that a court will take into consideration. On the allocation of damages, the class action should be firstly the most appropriate means of allocating damages to the members of the class. And applicants must ensure that they have appropriate mechanisms um, and they must propose those to the court to ensure that damages, if they are awarded, are allocated to members of class in a particular manner and also in a just manner. And then lastly, a class action must be the most appropriate means for determining the claims or the legal and factual issues which are in dispute and which are raised by the class. So the last section is on representation. And this is quite an important um, inquiry that a court makes when it's considering whether to certify a class action or not, but looking at the appropriateness of the representation that has been chosen by the, by the applicants. So a court here must be satisfied with really two broad issues when it comes to representation. The first is that there must be no conflict of interest in regards to the matter between the um, the representatives as well as the class. And secondly, is that they have the, the representatives must have the capacity to conduct the litigation properly on behalf of the class, as an unsuccessful litigation will have the effect of destroying the claims of all class members who have not opted out. So that's really, really important that they get that right. Now, when evaluating the representative's capacity to conduct the litigation, the certification court will likely have regard to a few aspects, um, a few of which we'll just go through today. So further, it's whether the representative has the time, the inclination and the means to procure the evidence that's necessary to conduct the litigation, whether the representatives have the financial means to conduct the litigation, um, also whether the representatives have access to lawyers who have the capacity to run the litigation properly. Now, an inquiry such as this one will have some consideration of the likely magnitude of the case and the resources that will be required in dealing with it. And a court will always have regard for the basis upon which the lawyers are going to be funded for the litigation. So if the litigation is to be funded on a contingency fee basis, the court will require the details of the funding arrangement in order to ensure that they, didn't, they don't give rise to a conflict of interest between the lawyers and the members of the class themselves. 
And the court must be satisfied that the litigation is not pursued by the lawyer for their own gain and is in fact in the genuine interest of the class. Still on the funding point, um, we just wanted to chat to you guys a little bit more on third party funding, because it's always a question of who's going to be paying for all of this litigation, especially since we've seen in even our, our most recent um, class actions, how long the process is and how long it actually takes before it, it goes to resolution. And that's just on certification. Now, third party funding of claims is permitted in South Africa in certain justifiable circumstances. So the South African principles regarding third party funding were scrutinized in the case, um, in the case of Goldfields versus Motley. And there the court essentially said that third party funding is permissible if it ensures that an indigent individual plaintiff will be granted access to the courts and therefore ensuring access to justice. So also in the Price um, Waterhouse Coopers versus, versus National Potato um, claim, the Supreme Court of Appeal found that an agreement in terms of which a person provides a litigant with funds to litigate in return for a reasonable share of the proceeds of the litigation is not contrary to public policy and that such an agreement would not be void. Ultimately, what the courts are trying to articulate is that third party funding allows access to justice for otherwise disempowered um, litigants. If we take, for example, the Listeriosis um, class action against Tiger Brands, one of the law firms that are involved in that case is a massive US-based law firm who are known as food experts in, the, in that industry. And they are an extremely important component of that case as they're able to provide the class action with both the legal and the financial support that it requires to succeed. As I'm sure we've seen, and we, for those who've been keeping up to date with it, a litigation of that magnitude and I guess complexity is it's going to take years um, to resolve and will require significant um, funding to see it through. And then on the last part of contingency fee agreements, these types of agreements are also allowed in South Africa, provided that they comply with the provisions of the Contingency Fees Act of 1997. And this includes the requirement that the so-called success fee doesn't exceed the normal fees. So these are the attorney's normal fees by 100%. And also provided that in the case of claims that are sounding in money, the total amount of the success fee payable by the client to its legal um, representatives may not exceed 25% of the total amount awarded or any amount obtained by the client as a result of the legal proceedings. Um, this cal calculation also doesn't include the cost that would be awarded to, to the clients or to the, to the applicants. So really what the Act tries to do is mitigate and manage the um, personal interests of the attorneys and ensuring that they are pursuing the matter on behalf of the clients in the interests of the public and in the interests of, of justice, ultimately. Um, thank you. I'll hand over to David. Thank you very much, Sir Sabile. Um, I'm going David? Um, David, I think you're on mute. Correct. Thank you very much. Someone had to say you're on mute in this. Um, I want to give a brief word on uh, Lisa's content to start here and the effect of Lita's contestatio on the transmissibility of damages and um, and in particular the transmissibility of general damages or non-pecuniary damages. Um, Lita's contestatio generally refers to the stage in litigation when pleadings are closed. It's dealt with in the court rules in Rule 29, which determine when pleadings are closed and stipulate generally that um, if all parties to the case of joint issue, they know, and there are no longer any new issues arising out of the pleadings, or what is generally more common, and that is that the time period for the filing of any subsequent pleading, normally that page has ex expired, or when the parties have agreed in writing that the pleadings have closed and um, have filed their agreement with the registrar, of the court, or if there's an absolute disagreement on the close of pleadings, 
when the court has declared that the pleadings are closed. So that is generally the point at which um, pleadings are closed and the parties um, can then take further steps in the litigation process. And that point when pleadings are closed is referred to as litus contestatio. Um, Manu, go over to the next one. Manu has already referred to um, the case of Ancala versus Harmony Gold Mining. Um, and in the context of class actions, um, this is the case which has had a material effect on the transmissibility of general damages. Um, Ancala versus Harmony was a class action on behalf of current and past underground mine workers who contract, contracted respiratory diseases, it was silicosis or tuberculosis. And there was, the the litigation took a long time to be completed. Um, and in the intervening period, a number of the, of the affected mine workers died as a result of their, um, their uh, lung disease. And so the issue arose whether the general damages which the uh, plaintiff could have claimed would be transmitted to his estate. Um, a claim for general damages pertains to the pain and suffering, loss of amenities of life and disfigurement suffered by the plaintiff. Historically, an executor could sue for any patrimonial loss, that is special damages, which a deceased suffered before his death, as well as funeral expenses, which would be a patrimonial loss suffered after death, obviously, and the dependents could sue for loss of support or any patrimonial loss which they would suffer as a result of the premature death of their um, financial provider or breadwinner. Historically, neither could sue for general damages which the deceased had suffered prior to his death. Um, the only exception was when the deceased had already uh, commenced action and the claim reached the stage of litus contestatio before the death of the plaintiff. And the claim is continued by the executor of his estate. In that instance, the claim for personal injuries, including general damages, did not end. And the law allows me to Um, in Ancala, the court was asked to declare that any claim for general damages, whether pre- or post litus contestatio, um, is transmissible to the estate of the deceased plaintiff. The court just, declare, um, just confirmed the previous position, and that is that the claim for general damages is not transmissible to the estate, that the general damages are personal to the claimant, and that neither the dependents nor the estate suffer any loss or damage from the pain and suffering loss of amenities of life and the disfigurement endured by the deceased during their lifetime. Therefore, they can have no claim for the bodily injury suffered by the deceased. In other words, the claim for general damages abated upon the death of the deceased. They have not abated, though, if litus contestatio was reached before the death of the plaintiff. Um, Go on to the next one. The court, after discussing the constitutional imperatives and principles, held that the common law should be developed very briefly as follows, that a plaintiff who had for general damages but who died, whether arising from harm caused by the delict uh, or otherwise, and whose claim had yet to reach Lita's contestatio, and who would, but for his death, be entitled to pursue the action and, and claim general damages, will be entitled to continue with the action, notwithstanding his or her death, obviously through the executor of the estate. Um, the person who would have been liable for the general damages, that is the defendant, if the death of a plaintiff had not ensued, remains liable for the, the general damages, notwithstanding the death of the plaintiff, um, the action shall be for the benefit of this estate of the person whose death had been caused, and that a defendant who dies while an action against him has commenced for general damages arising from harm caused by his delict 
and whose case is yet to reach Lita's front to start here, remains liable for the general damages, notwithstanding the death of the of the plaintiff. Will you go over it, Mona? So that is the effect of the Ancala versus Harmony case. Um, I just want to refer to two judgments which were handed down subsequent to the Ancala judgment. Um, one is the Urufia versus MEC for health case, and the other is Chidi versus the Road Accident Fund. Um, essentially, in the Urufia case, um, the plaintiff had effected four amendments, um, and shortly after the last amendment was effected to the plaintiff's pleadings on 4 October 2017, the plaintiff died five days later. Um, the deceased death occurred prior to the expiry of the 15-day period afforded to the defendant to file a consequential amendment to the plea. Um, the first defendant had not filed the consequential amendment. Um, the deceased was substituted by the executor as the plaintiff. So, um, and just go over to the next page. The court in the Olufia judgment had to determine essentially whether the amendment by the plaintiff of her particulars of claim had the effect of reopening pleadings and whether Lita's contestatio fell away. And then if Lita's contestatio did fall away and the pleadings are found not to have closed as a result of the defendant not yet having filed the consequential amendment to the plea, whether the claim for general damages was transmissible to the plaintiff's estate. Um, the court in the Ulufia judgment effectively um, re well, referred to the Ancala judgment and effectively said that um, the, well, commented that the principle was related to um, and limited to class actions. That was referred to in the minority judgment. But what the court in Ulufia effectively then said was that um the so just bear with me the effect of the plaintiff's amendment of her pleadings was that Lita's contest start here fell away and therefore her claim for non-patrimonial damages is not transmissible to her estate. That was in the Western Cape. In the Pretoria High Court, um in the Chini judgment, please just forward a few more um, and go really to my last slide. In the Chini judgment, the plaintiff had filed the notice of intention to amend and thus reopened the pleadings were, which were initially closed. The defendant had, had had an opportunity to object to the amendment. The court referred to Rule 29, which provided that pleadings are closed if either party has joined issue without alleging any new matter. Um, by filing an amendment, the plaintiff had added a further pleading. Um, and over to the next slide, please. The court in Chile referred to the Encala judgment. The court stated that the development of the common of the law should not be restricted to the case where the plaintiff had died pre litus contestatio. It must also apply to the case where the defendant or potential defendant dies pre litus contestatio and the same principles apply equally to defendants as they do to plaintiffs. Um, from the principle formulated in the Ancala case, it is immaterial whether the deceased died before or after litus contest contestatio. The executor of the deceased estate is entitled to proceed with the claim for general damages which fall into the estate of the deceased. And so effectively, this change in the law is applicable to all actions for personal injuries, whether they occur in the context of a class action or otherwise. Thank you very much. Hi again, everybody. So it might be worthwhile dealing with the issue of prescription in the context of class actions. And as some of you might be aware, Prescription is a legal principle in terms of which a debtor's 
liability to make payment of a debt is extinguished after the passing of a certain period of time. And the primary act that really deals with issues of prescription is the Prescription Act, although there are others, for instance, the RAF Act, that also deals with certain aspects of it insofar as those claims are concerned. And effectively, the Act sets out both, the, the Prescription Act sets out both the period of prescription that applies in certain instances, as well as the sort of the calculation of those periods. And so in, in general terms, most contractual and delictual claims against private individuals will prescribe after a period of three years. So the question is whether the service of a certification application interrupts prescription. So the first issue is section 12 of the Prescription Act, which effectively provides that prescription commences to run when a debt is due or when the creditor knew or reasonably should have known the identity of the debtor and the facts giving rise to the payment of the debt. And so far as the first issue is concerned, perhaps just from a practical perspective, it, it might occur in certain instances that parties agree that for instance, in a sale agreement, that payment of the goods will only be made after the passing of a period of time. And if such a such a clause is applicable, you know, the prescription will not commence running until that payment actually falls due. So you start calculating when the payment is due, for instance, rather than when the actual agreement is entered into or where the goods are delivered. And the same with regard to the second issue in the, the, the requirement for the creditor knowing the circumstances giving rise to the, the debt or the, or the uh, identity of the, the debtor. An example of that might be, for instance, with regard to minors, there's a specific provision in the Act which regulates when prescription starts to run and how it's dealt with insofar as minors are concerned. And effectively, it doesn't run minus not being in the Nikala judgment, minus being a person not having attained the age of majority. But the requirement is effectively that prescription only runs a year after they attain the age of minority, and there is an exception that it, it continues to run and then another year is added. The question is, as I said, whether the certification application interrupts prescription, and that has not been dealt with by the courts as is, uh, you know, it hasn't it hasn't been raised before the courts yet, and there isn't legislation specifically dealing with that. It has, however, been raised in the issue once again of the Children's Resources Trust matter, where it was held that because in that matter, the court now required a certification application to be instituted prior to the actual institution of the class action, that it may be argued that it is a necessary step and therefore it falls under the protection given by the provisions of section 15 of the Prescription Act, which provides that prescription gets interrupted when a process claiming payment of the debt is instituted. So just to contextualize it again, the certification application is not the action in terms of which payment of the debt is, con is, is uh, done. It is a necessary step in order for that application as a class action to be instituted. So th the point is just that the court in the Children's, Children's Resources Trust matter decided obiter that it, it may well be argued if the issue arises that because it's a necessary step, prescription is interrupted. So insofar as the practical considerations are concerned, as has been stated, the decision or, or the litigation involving a certification application may take a number of years to be finalized because that decision in of itself is subject to appeals as well. So whilst the certification application is in the process of being determined, it may be that the three-year period, which a debtor would have had in the normal instances, would have 
lapsed in the meanwhile. And to the extent that the certification application is dismissed, it may well be that a potential claimant will be non-suited because once the certification application is dismissed, it would have been considered that the prescription would not have been interrupted at all. So from that perspective, it might, it, it might non-suit prospective um, plaintiffs to the extent that they rely on the institution of the certification application and do not take steps on their own in order to potentially claim repayment of whatever debt might be, whether it's contractual or delictual. Then the second issue is that it's applicable only to, to class members. So a class can be described as either an opt-in class or an opt-out class. And the point is simply that to the extent that you might have a cause of action as a prospective plaintiff, you are not entitled to rely on the interruption of the prescription to the extent that you might have decided not to be part of the class action at some stage. So it might happen that a prospective uh, plaintiff would not be in agreement with the particular representatives of the class and elects at that stage to opt out. And the point is simply that the interruption would only be applicable to those persons that actually form part of the class action. Thanks very much. Over to Natasha. Thank you very much. So the defendant has one of two options. They can either proceed with the matter or they can settle the class action. If they do decide to defend the action, various factors need to be taken into consideration, such as the costs that might be involved in litigating a class action. The costs can run into millions for the defendant, and very often the plaintiff's class action is funded through a, a third party litigation funder. So in terms of the common law, generally speaking, a litigant may request a party who has instituted an action against it to pay security for costs incurred in defending the claim. But this doesn't mean that if the defendant in a class action is successful and a judgment is handed down in favor of the defendant, that the defendant will be in the position to always recover the legal costs incurred in defending the class action. The costs the courts tend to favor the individuals and indigent persons, as I said earlier, and have the discretion to decide whether to award costs against the losing party or not. And generally, courts are extremely hesitant to make an adverse order against individuals, and that is more so where the, the action has been brought in public interest. So as with the uniform rules of court in a class action, the number of defendants or oh, sorry, the number of witnesses to give evidence can be agreed between the parties. The evidence to be led on those issues that remain may be narrowed, and this is all aimed at curtailing the costs involved. If the parties decide to settle the matter, the settlement agreement can be made in order of court. It remains confidential until settlement has taken place. And in certain instances, like with the silicosis cases, the courts held that if the class has been certified and settlement has, re has been reached subsequent to the certification, the, cert the settlement agreement will only be valid on approval of the court. Furthermore, the courts would need to approve the settlement agreement if a contingency fee agreement applies between the plaintiffs and the attorneys, and Rita Bile um, spoke about this earlier. As alternatives, the parties may agree to refer the matter to arbitration. And what this generally entails is that once the action has been certified, the parties are required to enter into a written arbitration agreement. The arbitrator or panel of arbitrators, depending on the complexity of the case, is agreed. And the ruling is handed down by the arbitrator and it is binding on all parties unless the arbitration agreement has made provision for the right of an appeal. As a further alternative, the parties may decide to mediate, but 
Mediation is an alternative option in terms of which a mediator will facilitate the entire process with a view to the party settling the matter. And therefore, it is only encouraged where parties in good faith wish to settle the matter amicably. And that does not mean that there is no option then to continue to litigate if the parties decide on mediation as an option. Mediation is without prejudice. Um, and there is no real obligation to settle, as I said, if that is the route that has been taken. Issues tend to creep in where one party intends to, in fact, litigate, but actually enters into the mediation process to test the waters, so to speak, or, you know, to, 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 to test the strength of their case. So this is something that needs to be given very, very careful consideration when deciding on which route to take. And that's all from me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all our presenters. Um, that, I see we are two minutes over time. Um, I don't see any questions in the, in the chat box. Um, in the absence of any, does anyone have any questions? that they would like to raise with any of our presenters? Not. All right. Well, thank you very much to all the attendees from I2. Um, it's very good to be able to present to you on this. Um, please remember our financial institutions blog and our website where you can access a lot of information about various issues. Thank you very much for attending. And we are available at any time should you wish to discuss any aspect of this um, or get further information. But thank you very much.